Welcome back, everyone. Okay, so update on 3i Atlas. You know, what makes 3i Atlas so fascinating is that it refuses to behave like anything we've seen before. Or, or the people who are watching it and feeding us data are behaving in a way that is causing us to pay attention to this more than we normally would. If this thing was just a comet, it's almost like scientists are thinking, hey, if we kind of say it's a comet, but don't actually confirm that it's a comet and let the public think that it might be something else, then we'll get all this attention and then we can go get more money for funding. I mean, that would be a motive, wouldn't it? When something comes from outside our solar system, it automatically raises a lot of questions anyway. Where did it come from? What star system launched it? What conditions shaped it before it ever crossed paths with us? But in this case, those questions only expand as astronomers continue to study its composition and movement. 3 I Atlas doesn't quite fit the standards of any ordinary comet. Its orbit confirms it's not gravitationally bound to the sun, and its physical behavior, the way it brightens, changes color, the way it ejects material, is something more than just a comet. Since its closest approach to the sun, it appears to be experiencing what scientists call a non-gravitational acceleration meaning it's moving in a way that can't be explained purely by the sun's gravity. That could be due to jets of gas pushing it as the ice evaporates, but the magnitude and pattern of this acceleration are unusual. Add to that its shifting color and high CO2 content, which is far above what's normally seen in comets. It's changing color again, so it went from red to green to blue now. Government agencies are taking notice, according to recent reports, and NASA scientists have briefed congressional lawmakers about 3i Atlas. Not because it poses any threat, but because of what its unique characteristics could mean for our understanding of interstellar objects. Some media have nicknamed 3i Atlas the Black Swan of Astronomy, which is a term used to describe something rare, unexpected, and transformative. It's not hard to see why. So, a few things to talk about here as it starts to make its closest approach to Earth. If these scientists and professional astronomers can't tell us what this thing is by that time, then what good are they? So, 3i Atlas has now passed its perihelion, the point where it came closest to the sun, which occurred between October 29th and the 30th. And this would have been the point where it was most active and illuminated. During that passage, it came within about 1.36 to 1.38 astronomical units to the, of the sun, which puts it between the orbits of Earth and Mars. Now that's pretty close, but in cosmic terms, it's still a safe distance. Close enough for some astronomers to capture some of the best possible observations, as the sunlight should have intensified its outgassing and tail formation. But keep in mind, that is all based on what a comet is supposed to do, not on what was actually observed, you see? So it's near the orbital path of Mars, 
which means that scientists have an opportunity to compare its brightness and behavior from multiple observation angles using different instruments. Because of this alignment, observatories and space agencies, including NASA and the SETI Institution, coordinated their tracking to study how the object reacted to solar heating. So they know that this is an active interstellar object, not just a rock drifting through space. Now after it re-emerged in the pre-dawn sky, amateur astronomers using moderate telescopes have already started spotting it. And right now it's currently faint but stable. It still has a diffuse coma and a faint tail that became more visible through long exposure photography and it can now be observed again from Earth. But you need to have dark skies and it takes a bit of patience to find it. Mid-December 2025 is when we expect to see this thing's closest approach to Earth, around December 19th. And this is when they should be able to make their most detailed follow-up measurements. And from that point, it will begin its long outbound journey and should head back out into interstellar space. Now, there has been a lot of talk about its composition and nickel. And you may have heard Elon Musk talk about this a little bit on the Joe Rogan podcast recently. He did mention that there have been other objects that have had a heavy nickel composition. What he didn't say is that those objects have had an even higher iron composition. Those were iron objects, which means that they also had a high amount of nickel as well. So let me just clear this up. Because you may have heard that nickel is what we would use on our spacecraft because nickel is the best metal to use and most adaptable to space and using iron would be avoided as much as possible. When it comes to 3i Atlas and its observations with the ESO Very Large Telescope, the VLT, it detected emission lines for atomic nickel in its coma. Iron was much weaker or absent at many distances. That gives 3i Atlas a very high nickel to iron abundance ratio compared to other objects, just to be clear. Now, the color of this thing has been shifting over time, going from red to green to blue. And their explanation is this change is believed to be connected to the release of fresh icy particles and the evolving structure of its coma and tail. The timing suggests that as sunlight intensified, finer ice grains were ejected, altering how the comet's light was scattered and giving it that shifting appearance. They've been talking about this non-gravitational acceleration. In other words, its motion through space doesn't perfectly follow what would be caused by gravity alone. This kind of deviation happens when gas jets erupt unevenly from a comet's surface, subtly pushing it in unpredictable ways. And they're saying that 3i Atlas may have lost as much as 13% of its total mass during its close approach to the sun. And that type of outgassing could easily explain the extra thrust observed in its trajectory. But this is not what they have observed. They are assuming this based on what comets would do. Whatever the case, each new observation and every guess they place alongside it just confuses people. So folks, let me just briefly explain how all of this works so that you understand who and what you're dealing with here. Astronomy is not like most other sciences because you can't experimentally manipulate what you study. You can't change a galaxy's composition or move a comet to see what happens. All astronomers can do is observe light across different wavelengths 
and then interpret it. That's it. That means almost everything in astronomy is inferred, not directly measured. We infer a planet's existence by how it tugs on its star's light. We infer a comet's composition from how it absorbs or emits certain light frequencies. We infer distances through redshift or parallax. So astronomy deals in models and mathematical descriptions that fit what we see. And these models are tested, they're refined, sometimes replaced, but very few things are 100% confirmed in the way that laboratory chemistry or engineering results are. Folks, when you hear the word theory, to us, that sounds uncertain. But in science, a theory is the highest form of understanding. Like the theory of gravity or the theory of evolution. So they don't even use the word theory most of the time. They'll say something like, we know that blah, blah, blah. Or they might make it come across as a fact. So when you hear about something like dark matter, dark energy, black holes, or multiverse, these are not proven facts. They are best fit models that explain observed data. So a big truth here is that much of astronomy is about working in hypotheses that fit current data, but are open to being replaced when better evidence appears. Even mainstream astrophysicists will admit this. First, they take raw data from telescopes or instruments, right? This data is usually noisy and requires calibration and interpretation. Then teams write papers with their interpretations, and sometimes they disagree. These papers are then sent to journals where other experts anonymously review them for their methods and plausibility. If they're approved, then they're published. But this doesn't mean proven. It means reasonable and worthy of further scrutiny. Then you'll have a university PR department or NASA issue a press release. This is where the narrative starts to shift because the headlines get simplified, they get sensationalized, or they leave out all the uncertainty. Then you'll have space.com, live science, the New York Post, etc. They will rewrite the press release. Sometimes it's accurate, sometimes it's not. All to attract clicks. By the time it reaches the public, the nuance and uncertainty are gone. So when you hear something like, scientists discover a metal never seen before in a comet, it may actually mean one telescope detected a spectral line that could be some type of nickel compound and it's pending confirmation. You see what I mean? There is a translation gap. You know, a lot of the time when we think scientists are trying to cover something up by remaining silent, they're actually just moving super slow because they are operating in an industry that is structured around funding and reputation. Research grants come from institutions like NASA, the NSF, or the European Space Agency, and to get funded, scientists must propose research that sounds accurate. It has to be important and fit within an accepted paradigm. Unconventional theories like panspermia, plasma cosmology, or non-gravitational physics models fall outside the dominant narrative. So they struggle to get funding. So the system naturally filters out fringe or high risk ideas and, and they reinforce consensus models. 
So it is a bias toward stability and against paradigm shifts. So I don't care if it's the solar system structure and planetary motions, the chemical composition of stars and comets, the expansion of the universe, the existence of galaxies, exoplanets, black holes, cosmic background radiation. These all remain active areas of debate. In other words, the framework is solid, but the fine details are constantly being rewritten. All of this is shaped by PR departments, science communicators, and corporate media, which means truth becomes entertainment and all the nuance is lost. In private, the scientists will tell you how uncertain and frustrating real data is. In public, they'll tell a clean story because that's what institutions and audiences expect. So when you hear new claims, whether they're from NASA, Harvard, or some online leak, the best question is not, is it true? Instead, the question should be, what exactly was observed? And what part is inference or interpretation? And that is what will separate genuine discovery from narrative-driven hype. Anyway, that's going to be all for now, folks. And there is more to come, so stay tuned. Please click the thumbs up button and like this video. And let me know what you all think in the comments below. Everyone have a great day. And as always, stay awake, stay aware, stay safe. And I'll talk to you all soon.